welcome to lesson 4.3 traffic loading path 2. This is the third lecture in payment design module. In the last lesson which was on traffic loading part 1, we have discussed various parameters of traffic loading that need to be considered for payment design which included the loading which also included the transverse distribution of wheel loads. We would also discussed about various types of vehicles that we have to consider, big vehicles, small vehicles which carry heavier uh, loads and small loads and other features of traffic loading parameters we discussed. Uh, last class we did not specifically discuss about certain aspect which is on how to take into account the different loads that are carried by vehicles. Besides this, we will also consider certain other aspects that are very important for payment design. The specific instructional objectives of this lesson would be, after completing this lesson, the student is expected to be familiar with the procedures for converting a given multi-wheel load system, multi-wheel load system consisting of two wheels, more than two wheels, number of axles, how to convert all those number of wheels into an equivalent single wheel load. We will also try to learn the concept of the relative damaging effect of axle loads and using this concept how different number of repetitions of different magnitudes of loads can be converted into an equivalent number of a standard load. So, we will be discussing about two different concepts mostly in this how to convert a given lo wheel load configuration into an equivalent wheel load, single wheel load that is, or how to convert different number of repetitions of different load magnitudes into an equivalent number of repetitions of a standard load. We will also be discussing about the approaches that are normally adopted taking into account the uh, traffic design and payment design. There are three, four approaches are there. We will also be discussing those approaches. Normally, traffic load is considered in design in different ways. We understand that payments of highways or airports or other types of roads carry different types of vehicles. This we discussed in the previous lesson. And these vehicles, which are different in shape and size, carry different magnitudes of loads, and these loads occur repeatedly. Some facilities carry more number of repetitions during its service life period, some carry lesser number of loads, some of these facilities carry very heavy loads, some carry loads of lesser magnitudes. How do we take these variations into account while designing payments? We understand there are going to be repetitions of loads, we also understand that the loads are of different magnitude. So, how do we account for all these things? and come out with one single number or one single load which can be used and input in payment design. Which vehicle has to be designed or how many number of repetitions of a standard load we have to design the payment for? These are the issues that we are going to discuss in this lesson. Load consideration payment design are usually adopted in uh, as per three different approaches. First one is fixed traffic approach then we have fixed vehicle approach, then the third approach is variable traffic, variable vehicle approach. Let us take up each one of these approaches one by one and discuss them. In the fixed traffic approach, the heaviest anticipated vehicle is of importance for us. This is our main concern. The number of repetitions that a given facility gets is of not that significance compared to the load that the heaviest vehicle is going to carry. We are very seriously concerned about the load that the biggest vehicle or heaviest vehicle is going to be applying on the payment. Naturally, these are facilities where the number of repetitions are not that significant, significantly high. For example, when we talk about airport payments, airports can have vehicles uh, which would uh, whose magnitudes of loads would be varying very significantly 
there can be very heavy vehicle, there can be smaller vehicles. The number of repetitions no, are not of uh, the order of millions like we have in the case of highway payments. So, numbers of repetitions are not very significant, but the load is very significant in this case. So, the payments are designed for a single wheel load. We are not going to take the entire configuration because the heaviest vehicle will have certain configuration in terms of the number of axles it is going to have and in terms of the number of wheels it is going to have on each axle. All these configurations, whatever be the configuration, number of axles, number of wheels will have to be converted into a single load, equivalent single load, equivalent being that it would produce a similar damaging effect on the pavement as would be produced by the total vehicle. So, we will be talking about an equivalent single wheel load and that is the input parameter that we will use for designing payments for these facilities where heaviest vehicle is of concern for us. As I indicated, multiple wheels that a vehicle has got of different configurations will be converted into an equivalent single wheel load ESWL. This is commonly used for design of airport payments and for highway payments and other roads which would carry very heavy loads, uh, but it will have less traffic volumes. But nowadays this is not a very commonly used approach. On the other hand, in the fixed vehicle approach for design of payments, the design is governed by the number of repetitions of a standard vehicle. Here we will talk about a standard vehicle and then how many repetitions of a standard vehicle the payment is supposed to carry, so that number is going to be the input parameter for payment design. But we understand that there are going to be different magnitudes of loads, different types of vehicles and each type of vehicle may have different repetitions during the service life period, during the 20 years of life period or 15 years of life period of a given payment. 10 ton axles may be certain number, 8 ton axles may be a different number. 6 tons axle may be different number. All these weights, all these numbers will have to be converted into a equivalent number of repetitions of a standard load. The most uh, commonly used or rather the standard load that is considered is a 18 keep, 18,000 pound single axle load that is 80 kilo Newton load single axle load is considered to be the standard axle load. All the vehicles, all the axle loads that a payment is expected to carry, expected to receive during its design life period will be converted into equivalent repetitions of 80 kN single axle load repetitions. Axles that are neither uh, single nor equal to 80 kN will be converted into equivalent standard axle loads using equivalent axle load factors. These are conversion factors that will use to convert a given load into an equivalent repetitions of the standard load which is 80 kN. In this we multiply the repetitions of a given axle load by the equivalent axle load factor corresponding to that particular load and this will give us the equivalent number of 80 kN axle load repetitions. But we have to have some information about what is the equivalent load factor that we have to use or equivalent axle load factor that we have to use to convert a given load into equivalent repetitions of a standard load. The sum of all these equivalent repetitions obtained for all the axle loads anticipated that uh, anticipated uh, to be coming during the design life period is used as the design life period. This number of equivalent standard axles is the design input for design. Most of the design approaches follow this method of considering payment uh, traffic in payment design. We can also have an approach which is called as variable vehicle variable traffic approach in which we will not talk about a fixed vehicle, we will not talk about a standard load, we will not talk about tra standard traffic level also. Rather whatever be the load, whatever be the number of corresponding repetitions, we will take into account all of that. If you have 10,000 repetitions of 10 ton axle, we will find out what is the damage caused by 10,000 repetitions of 10 ton axles and certain other repetitions of 8 ton axle and then 
may be another 30,000 repetitions of 6 ton axle, we will take into account all the loads and all the corresponding repetitions. We will not talk about anything fixed here. So, there is no need to deal traffic either in terms of equivalent standard, ax, uh, standard wheel load or equivalent standard axle load. Such an approach is normally used with procedures where we calculate the cumulative damage of the payment caused by individual loads and the corresponding numbers, such as uh, uh, design approaches where we are trying to calculate cumulative fatigue damage or accumulated permanent deformation. Such approaches we can use this, but still this is also not a very common approach. Coming to the fixed traffic approach, where we are having to convert a given vehicle into an equivalent single wheel load. You may have two wheels, we may be talking about a dual wheel set, which needs to be converted into an equivalent single wheel load, or we may be talking about four different wheel loads which has to be converted into an equivalent single wheel load. So, there has to be some definition of what is equivalence and then how that has to be calculated. There are various approaches that are followed. Equivalent single wheel load is defined as the load on a single tire or single wheel that will cause an equal magnitude, equal magnitude that is where the equivalence is coming to picture of a pre-selected parameter, equivalence in terms of a pre-selected parameter either stress, strain, deflection or some other distress. At a given location within a specified payment system to that resulting from a multiple wheel load at the same location within the same payment system. So, we are trying to compare two different situations. We have the effect produced by a single wheel load that is equivalent single wheel load in a given payment system at a given location. The equivalent effect is in terms of the deflection that is produced, stress that is produced or it can be strain. We will have to select one of these parameters, different agencies select different parameters and we are also talking about a particular payment system and the parameter is calculated at a particular location in the payment. So, these are all fixed. So, individual agencies define equivalent single wheel load using different framework of what is the payment system that is considered, what is the location at which this parameter is calculated and what is the parameter we are calculating. So, equivalence is in terms of a selected parameter for a selected payment at a selected location. The parameters of equivalence can be as we just indicated some of them equal vertical stress, equivalent single wheel load will have to produce same magnitude of vertical stress as would be produced by a set of wheel loads. It may be in terms of equal vertical deflection, it can be in terms of equal tensile strain, equal contact pressure, equal contact radius. These parameters can be theoretically be calculated using some appropriate theory or they can be experimentally be determined as specified by the design methodology. So, any design methodology which uses an equivalent single wheel load approach has to specify how this equivalent single wheel load has to be determined. Whether it has to be determined by an experimental approach, if it is an experimental approach what sort of an experiment has to be conducted, how exactly this has to be done and if it is a theoretical one which theory is to be used at what location, which parameter has to be calculated, complete framework has to be specified by the agency which is using this equivalent single wheel load approach. The first concept that we will use to determine equivalent single wheel load is equal vertical stress concept. So, here we are referring to equal vertical stress that is produced by right now that we are seeing here is a dual wheel set you have two wheel loads applied on a payment system. Each wheel load carries P D as the load. And the clear spacing between these two wheels is D and the center to center spacing between these two wheels is S D. If you can see, see from this diagram, if you have, uh, make some simplification about the load distribution 
through this payment, stress distribution through the payment. At a depth of d by 2, these two envelopes just start getting overlapped. The stress envelopes produced by the two individual wheel loads just start getting overlap. And then at a significantly larger depth, which is approximately equal to twice S d, the suffix d is uh, normally used because we normally refer to dual wheel sets and uh, its conversion into equivalent single wheel load, but that is not exactly required. So, at a depth of 2 S d or beyond, the overlap is of such significant magnitude uh, to, to such an extent. We can consider the stress produced at any given lo location within this overlap zone will be equal to that of the loads that is uh, uh, the stress that is produced by P d left side left side wheel and the right side wheel combined together. Let us see how this, co this concept can be used to compute equivalent single wheel load. We are referring to equal maximum subgrade vertical stress. If we have a two layer system, we are talking about the subgrade vertical stress on top of subgrade. If we have single layer system where there is no payment, it is only subgrade that we are talking about. Normally, such systems are not of much importance to us, but still if we are referring to a single layer system, we are referring to vertical stress at a specified depth. This is based on the approximation of stress distribution in the layer system or single layer system. For a payment thickness less than d by 2, if you have a payment of thickness less than d by 2, as we have seen in the previous slide, there is no overlap. Hence, the equivalent single load, single wheel load will be P d that is equal to one single wheel load. The other wheel load is not coming to picture its influence is not to be seen at smaller depths. At depths of approximately 2 S d or greater, the effect of overlap is such that it is equivalent to the stress caused by 2 P d twice the magnitude of each one of these wheel loads. But for intermediate depths, a linear interpolation is made between the load and the thickness plotted on a log log scale. Let us see this in the next slide. This concept is pre presented pictorially here. On the x axis, we have the thickness plotted on a log scale. On the y axis, the corresponding equivalent single wheel load is plotted. As you can see here, for depths less than d by 2, the equivalent single wheel load will be P d. For depths more than or equal to 2 S d, the equivalent single wheel load would be 2 P d. And for any intermediate depth given by Z, the corresponding equivalent single wheel load P can be obtained by interpolation. The expression for this is given here log equivalent single wheel load is equal to log P d. This is one single wheel load of the dual wheel system plus point 301 log twice depth divided by d, small d is the clear distance between the wheel loads divided by log of 4 s t, s t is the center to center spacing between the wheel loads divided by the clear spacing between the wheel loads. Let us take an example and then calculate the equivalent single wheel load. What we have here is a dual wheel system, each wheel carrying 20 kilo Newton. The center to center spacing between these two wheels is 300 millimeters and the radius of contact area assuming that these are circular contact areas is 100 millimeter. So, this will give us P d equal to 20 kilo Newton, S d equal to 300 millimeters and then d will be equal to 300 minus 100 minus 100 that will be 100 millimeters. And the depth that we are specifying is 200 millimeter. So, z is equal to 200. Let us say the calculations. And this is how we assume the stress distribution is going to be. So, at a depth 
of less than 50 millimeter that is d by 2, there is no overlap. So, the equivalent single wheel load is going to be 20 kilo Newton at a depth of 600 millimeters that is twice S d that is 2 into 300. There is going to be complete overlap. So, within this region the equivalent single wheel load will have to be 2 into 20 kilo Newton that will be 40 kilo Newton, but in between at a depth of 200 millimeter at which we are interested in the equivalent single wheel load has to be somewhere between 20 kilo Newton and 40 kilo Newton. So, this we can see from this plot for Fifty kilo newton, uh, fifty millimeter depth. Twenty is the equivalent single wheel load. For six hundred millimeter depth, forty is the equivalent single wheel load. But for two hundred millimeter depth, plotted in a log log scale, we can directly obtain what is this thickness. Let us see if we can, if we can calculate this. So log of equivalent single wheel load. will be equal to log 20 using the expression that we have given in the previous slide plus 0 0.301 log 2 into 200 by 200 is the depth by log 4 into 300 by 200. Solving this, we will get an equivalent single wheel load of 34.2 kilo Newton. This could have been obtained graphically also. We can also adopt equal vertical de deflection concept. In this approach, single wheel having the same contact radius as one of the dual wheels or as one of the multiple wheels that are there and resulting in a maximum deflection equal to that caused by multiple wheels. So, we are trying to equate the deflection, we are trying to equate the maximum deflection produced by equivalent single wheel load and produced by a given set of wheel loads. Some of approaches also use equal contact pressure. Here we are trying to equate, keep the contact radius or contact area of the equivalent single wheel load equal to, the, uh, to that of one single wheel load of the given loading system. Normally we calculate the deflection at the interface of a payment or at a specified depth in the payment system, if it is only single layer system. So, if it is a single layer system, we calculate the deflection at a specified depth. If it is a payment and the subgrade a two layer system, the deflection will be calculated at the interface. There are number of methods available for working out these parameters. If it is a single layer system, we will use what is known as a elastic half space analysis. We will be discussing these things in greater detail when we talk about analysis of payments, but at this stage we will just use some charts or some method that is available for calculating these things. And we also have two layer systems for which we can calculate interlayer deflections, standard charts are available. If you have computer programs, we can calculate any of these things. This is depicted here, we have a two wheel system here separated by spacing s, each load being p and load rates being small a. This is a two layer system which is characterized by its Poisson ratio value and the modulus value. Modulus values are E1, E2 for the two layers, M1 and M2 represent the Poisson ratio value for both the layers. So, what we are trying to identify for the given loading system which is given on the left hand side is to find out where the maximum deflection would be at the interface which is at a depth of h. So, maximum deflection 
on the interface, we have to explore different locations. Obviously, it has to be somewhere from the center line of one of the wheel loads and uh, at the axis of symmetry of the both the wheel loads. So, we explore different points, calculate the deflection, find out where the maximum deflection is going to be. And similarly, to obtain the equivalent single wheel load, we will keep the radius of this equivalent single load constant uh, are, are equal to, to that of the uh, radius of contact of one of these wheel loads. We keep the same parameters and at this depth obviously, the maximum deflection is going to be along the axis of symmetry at the interface. So, we will try to calculate this and we will try to work out where the maximum deflection is going to be for the system that is there on the left hand side. Then the wheel load that will produce the same amount of maximum deflection corresponding to the left hand side system will be the equivalent single wheel load. For a single layer system, the deflection is usually a function of the contact stress, radius of contact area and a function of the modulus, of, modulus value of the system multiplied by a factor f which is called as deflection factor. Where d is the deflection at depth z and the radial distance r which is measured from the center of the load and E is the elastic modulus value of the payment subgrade modulus value in case of a two layer system. And F is the deflection factor which is a function of the position of the wheel, a position of the point at which we are trying to calculate the deflection. R is the radial distance from the center of the load, Z is measured from the payment surface. We have charts of this type available for computing vertical deflection factors as a function of depth expressed as a ratio of z by this is the radius of load contact area and also as a function of radial distance at which if this is the location at which you are trying to calculate the deflection. So, we are referring to this radial distance and this depth expressed as r by a and z by a, where a is the radius of load contact area. So, if you know the location, we know r, we know z expressed as r by a and z by a, then for a given z by a and r by a, we can get the corresponding f value. Once we get the f value, we can substitute this in the previous expression. If we know the modulus value of this material, if you know P, the pressure and then A, we can calculate the deflection. So, as you can see here, deflection produced by an equivalent single wheel load is equal to the pressure of equivalent single wheel load load radius that is P A load radius which is equal, nothing but equal to the load radius of the uh, any one of those loads that are there in the given system. And then deflection factor that is applicable for the equivalent single wheel load and then modulus value of the separate. For the multiple system, we have to get the tire pressure corresponding to the multiple system. This is given, this is known to us. And we also know the radius of contact area. We have to obtain what is the maximum deflection factor for the number of loads that we have and also where the maximum deflection is going to be. This we have to obtain. This is also known. So, for equivalence concept, this has to be equal to this. The deflection produced by equivalent single wheel load has to be equal to deflection produced by multiple wheel loads. That means, pressure for equivalent single wheel load multiplied by the load deflection factor for equivalent single wheel load will be equal to pressure corresponding to multiple wheel load and then maximum deflection factor which correspond to the maximum deflection produced by the given load system. This is known, P multiple is known. F maximum is a function of the wheel load configuration. 
that is with reference to any one single wheel load where the r and z are uh, for the uh, points at which we are exploring to find out the maximum deflection f equivalent single wheel load is a function of h and obviously we are referring to r equal to 0 because maximum deflection is going to be produced along the x of symmetry so r is 0 but we have to see what is the depth at which we are referring to then the corresponding factor has to be selected so this way p equivalent single wheel load and the corresponding equivalent single wheel load can be obtained once you get this from this and the load contact area we can calculate equivalent single wheel load for a two layer system also we can adopt similar concept here also we use the same approach the deflection is a function of pressure load contact area rather the radius of load contact area deflection factor and the subgrade modulus value where f is the interface deflection because if it is a two layer system we are interested in the deflection that occurs at interface so f is the interface deflection factor which is a function of like in the previous case the radial distance and the pavement thickness which defines the location of the interface so we have a similar chart available for interface deflection factor given by f which is a function of the radial distance r and the thickness of the pavement which defines the interface location you have you normally get standard charts in uh, standard literature for various charts available uh, available for different modular ratios where e1 is the modulus value of the upper layer e2 is the modulus value of the lower layer for any given ratio you can get a, a set of chart for this so once you identify the chart that has to be used you know the radius at which this has to be calculated and also the thickness of the pavement which defines the interface location we can identify the interface deflection factor so following the same approach that we used earlier equivalent single wheel load is p equivalent single wheel load a deflection factor for equivalent single wheel load and then modulus value d multiple deflection produced by multiple wheel loads is pressure multiple radius of load contact area the deflection factor that, that corresponds with maximum deflection produced by all those wheel loads modulus value of the subgrade equating these two will get this pressure multiplied by deflection factor for both the systems like in the real case we know multiple system p f maximum has to be evaluated for the given configuration f equivalent single wheel load is a function of thickness since r is 0 once we get this value we can calculate the corresponding equivalent single wheel load here is an example we are trying to work out equivalent single wheel load for a dual wheel load system 20 kN in each separated by 300 mm center to center spacing A is 100 mm the modulus value of the first layer is 250 megapascals modulus value of the se second layer is 50 Poisson ratio values of both the layers is taken as 0.5 interface is at a depth of 200 millimeters that is thickness of the pavement is 200 millimeters for this how we proceed is for the given loading system we explore different locations starting from point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3 we can explore more points also so find out what is the deflection at this location what is the deflection at this location or alternately we will try to find out what is the deflection factor because once you know deflection factor p a deflection factor divided by modulus value of the subgrade other things being constant deflection is basically a function of f so for point 1 the for load a radius is 0 so r by a 0 z is z by a is 2 that is 200 by 100 that is 2 so the deflection factor corresponding to this load at this point can be obtained using the chart we know r by a z by a 
Similarly, the deflection that is produced at this location by load B can also be worked out by the corresponding uh, radial distance and the depth for this point and for this load the radial distance is 300 millimeter. So, that is 300 by 100 that is 3. Z by E is uh, same ratio as we have here. So, for this the deflection factor as seen from the previous chart is 0.28, in this case it was 0.5. So, the total deflection factor which is influenced by both these V loads at this point is 0.5 plus 0.28 that is 0.78. Similarly, for 0.2 R by A is 1, Z by A is 2 because the radial distance is 100, A is 100, so R by A is 1, Z is 200, A is 100, Z by A is 2. So, this deflection factor is 0.45. The deflection factor due to B can also be similarly obtained R by A is 2, Z by A is 2, deflection factor is 0.36. So, the total deflection factor is 0.45 plus 0.36 that is 0.81. We can also similarly explore 0.3. So, for both load A and B, the deflection factor can be obtained as 0.4 because of symmetry. So, the total factor here is 0.3. So, out of the three locations that were explored to identify where the maximum deflection is going to be on the interface, you can see 0.2 gives a deflection factor of 0.81. Possibly, there could have been another point where if you can explore it further, which would have been slightly larger than this 0.81 value. Anyway, assuming that this is the location where maximum deflection is going to be. So, we will find out the corresponding equivalent single wheel load to produce similar deflection at that location. So, P multiple is given as 20,000 by this is the radius. So, this is the pressure for the given system 20 kilo Newton is there radius of contact is given. So, we can calculate the tire pressure. So, P equivalent single wheel load multiplied by factor of equivalent single wheel load is equal to P multiple into P ma F maximum. F maximum we already worked out as 0 0.81 pressure is 0 0.6364 that we have calculated. F equivalent single wheel load will be for a given single wheel load R equal to 0, z by a is 2, for this f will be 0.5. So, this is also determined. So, we only need to determine what is the tire pressure corresponding to equivalent single wheel load. This from this expression you can calculate it as 1.031. Once we have the tire pressure corresponding to equivalent single wheel load, we can calculate the equivalent single wheel load tire pressure multiplied with the area of contact area, uh, load contact area since we know the radius of load contact. Okay. So, this gives us 32.4 kilo Newton. There are various other concepts also that can be utilized for working out equivalent single wheel loads. We have seen equal vertical stress, we have also seen equal vertical deflection at a certain depth or at the interface. We can also use equal tensile strain, equal tensile stress or other concepts also can be used. If you are using fixed vehicle concept, wherein we are talking about a fixed vehicle and converting the repetitions of all other vehicles into an equivalent number of repetitions of the fixed vehicle, we are going to make use of equivalent accelerate factors. In some design methods, payments are designed for a selected number of repetitions as we discussed earlier. The standard load that is considered is 80 kilo Newton. Equivalent axle load factors are used to convert different axle loads into equivalent repetitions of standard axle. Equivalent axle load factor defines the damage caused to the payment by one application of the axle load under consideration 100 kilo Newton or 120 kilo Newton relative to the damage caused by a single application of a standard axle which is 80 kilo Newton. So, the damage caused to the pavement by different axle loads is compared and equivalent axle load factors are worked out. 
if you know the equivalent axial load factors for different load groups, if we have that information. So, the design would be based on the total number of applications of standard axial load during the design period given as total number of equivalent standard axial loads will be sum of axial load factor, equivalent axial load factor corresponding to ith load group and the number of repetitions of the ith load group. For designing payments, it is necessary to have information on the equivalent load factors for any particular load group that we want to convert into equivalent standard axles. And we also need to have the expected axle load spectrum over the next 20 years or 15 years. How many repetitions of certain load group 0 to 5 kilo Newton, how many repetitions, 5 to 10 kilo Newton, how many repetitions, 10 to 15, how many? This information is required. Somebody has to make projections about this. And we also have to have equivalent load factors so that we can convert each one of these load groups into equivalent standard axle load repetitions. The axle load spectrum is nothing but number of passes of axles for different load groups. And equivalent axle load factor is a function of we cannot have the same equivalent fa uh, load factor for a given load. For example, if you are talking about 100 kilo Newton, we will not have exactly the same equivalent load factor for all situations. It is a function of the type of payment that we are referring to, its composition, strength and also the criterion that we are using to define performance of the payment. Equivalent axle load factors are usually determined by conducting axle load surveys uh, in the uh, field or rather by observing the uh, relative damage caused by different axle load groups to a given specified payment system. The equal load factors obtained from Ashore road test are most commonly used by almost all the agencies. Ashore road test uh, we have referred to this earlier which was conducted in the 1950s and 60s. So, this was one of the concepts that has evolved out of Ashore road test. Equivalent axial load factors can also be obtained from theoretical exercise using appropriate mechanistic criteria. Equivalent axial load factors are different for different types of payment as I indicated in the previous slide. E equivalent axial load factors are a function of payment type, the approach that we use for defining performance. The ASHO equivalent load factors have been derived out of large number of experiments that, that were conducted on different types of payments by loading these payments with different load magnitudes and by observing the performance of these payments, the damage that is caused to these payments by different load magnitudes. So, uh, these are usually uh, found in tabulated form for different types of payments, different load magnitude, different equivalent standard axial load factors are available, but a simplification of this is what is known as the fourth power law. Which is given as equivalent standard axial load factor is axial load under consideration divided by the standard axial load which is 80 kilo Newton to the power 4. That is why it is called as fourth power law. This is an approximate one. For example, we, if we are referring to 160 kilo Newton load and we are trying to convert that into equivalent number of 80 kilo Newton standard axial. So, the conversion factor will be or rather the equivalent standard axial load factor will be 160 by 80 to the power 4 that is equal to 16. This means that a 160 kilo Newton axle is capable of producing about 16 times more damage compared to a 80 kilo Newton axle. So, this way you can obtain equivalent standard axle load factors for different load groups only we have to use the fourth power law. The ASHO equivalent uh, axle load factors as you can see in uh, various standard literature are given as for different axle load groups. Each uh, axle load group is given in terms of kips 1000 pounds. For example, 18 kilo Newton uh, 18000 pounds is the standard axle. Okay. So, corresponding to this you will have equivalence factor to be 
one. If you consider 40,000 pounds axle load, so this should approximately correspond to 40 by 18 to the power 4. So, this would be approximately equal to 39.57, but this is more precise value as obtained in the Asher road test. But this is for a payment whose terminal condition is defined in terms of a terminal serviceability index value of 2, we will not discuss about this right now, but this is for a specified definition of serviceability and for different types of payments defined by what is known as structural number, more the structural number, stronger is the payment. So, for different types of structural numbers, you have different equivalent standard axle load factors. So, we cannot have for all types of payments on for all types of performance definitions, we cannot have the same equivalent axle load factor. We will have similar factors available for concrete payments. In this case, instead of the structural number, the strength of the payment is represented in terms of the slab thickness, in terms of inches 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and so on. Again, this is specified for a particular terminal condition of the payment defined as P t equal to 2. Similar tables are available for different other serviceability, uh, terminal serviceability values 2.5, 3 and so on. So, in order to be able to convert given axle load spectrum into equivalent number of equ uh, standard axles, we need to have information about the axle load spectrum that is going to be there during the design life period. For this, we have to carry out axle load survey. Axle load survey is nothing but measurement of axle loads on a sample basis of all the commercial vehicles or rather a sample of commercial vehicles that are plying on a given facility. If there is a new road, so we cannot naturally collect samples on this particular road. We will collect data on similar facility which can be considered to be applicable to this facility also when it is constructed and this data is collected using portable way pads because we cannot expect the vehicles to be taken to a way bridge at a standard location, fixed location. So, what we have to use are portable way pads which can be placed on the road and you can stop the vehicles, measure each one of these wheels and from that you can collect axle load information. This photograph here shows a portable way pad that was developed by IIT Kharagpur. A improved version of this is presently available in a commercial form. You can see the wheel load placed on the way pad. On either side, you have wooden ramps facilitating the vehicle to climb on that. What we do in this survey is we select a sample, we will not normally stop all the commercial vehicles. We are only trying to take the weights of commercial vehicle, this we have discussed in the previous uh, lesson. We are interested as far as the payment is concerned only in commercial vehicles because other smaller vehicles will not be able to produce significant damage to the payment. Adequate sample has to be selected. Usually only wheel loads are measured, normally complete axle is not measured, but if you put two pads on either side, you can measure the complete axle simultaneously. If you are measuring only wheel load, we assume the axle load to be approximately equal to twice the wheel load that is measured and commercial axles normally in both the directions are monitored. So, if you have a data collected like this having load group of 0 to 40 kilo Newton, this is the frequency, 40 to 80 kilo Newton, this is the frequency, 80 to 120 this is the frequency and the midpoint of this is 20 this is the equivalent axle load factor 20 divided by 80 to the power 4, this would be the equivalent axle load factor. Then equivalent number of standard axles, if you have 50 axles ranging from 0 to 40 kilo newtons, these 50 axles would be equivalent to 3.13 numbers of 80 kilo newton axles. Similarly, 160 to 200 load range group, if you have 40 axles, midpoint of this will be 180 equivalent axle load factor will be 
180 divided by 80 to the power 4 and this multiplied by 40, this is the equivalent number of 80 kilo Newton standard axle loads. So, that is the equivalence of 40 numbers of loads ranging between 160 to 200. So, similarly we can work out equivalent standard axles for each one of these load groups knowing the frequency for each load group. As you can see the total of these axles that have been measured is about 1000. So, these 1000 axles are equivalent to if you take a sum of this, this is equivalent to 5000.6 standard axles. That means, one axle is equal to approximately about 5 standard axles. We have measured about 450 commercial vehicles, they had about 1000 axles because some of the vehicles had more than 2 axles. So, 450 commercial vehicles are equal to 5000 standard axles, that means, one commercial vehicle is equivalent to 5000 divided by 450 that is 11.11. This is called as vehicle damage factor which is a representative parameter that will give us one commercial vehicle is approximately equal to so many standard axles. So, that means, vehicle damage factor if you have this information with you for a given road, this is the vehicle damage factor to be adopted. Then if you know what are the commercial vehicles that are going to be there, that multiplied by this vehicle damage factor will give us equal number of standard axles. So, this is how we can obtain the vehicle damage factor by conducting a axle load survey, by knowing the number of commercial vehicles that were sampled, by converting all of them into equal number of standard axles. Okay. <coughs> so, this we have discussed, this if we can get information on vehicle damage factor, which can be determined by conducting axle load surveys, we can convert the commercial vehicles into equal number of standard axles. We also take into account uh, the speed also at times into consideration. This is important for selecting appropriate metal properties at any given location on the pavement. If the load is away, the stress is 0. As the load approaches this location, stress builds up, reaches a maximum. As the load moves away, stress becomes 0 again. So, this is how the stress builds up. So, the points that are closer to the surface will have higher stresses, but smaller loading time, whereas these points that are at lower depths will have much larger loading times, but smaller uh, magnitude of stress. This concept again we will discuss when we talk about characterization of payment materials. So, estimating design traffic, we have discussed this partly in the previous uh, lecture. We need to start with initial traffic, we have to have information on vehicle damage factor, we also have to have lateral placement characteristics. Using this information, we can calculate what will be the total number of standard axles that are expected during the design life period of 20, 15, 25 years. For example, if you take a design life of 15 years and a traffic growth rate of 8 percent, VDF of 4.5 and if it is a 6 lane road, divided facility as you have seen in the earlier case, we are using a distribution factor of 0.6. So, we can work out the number of equivalent standard axle load repetitions as 160.55. In this case, we have also used a vehicle damage factor of 4.5. To summarize, in this lesson, we have discussed about fixed vehicle, fixed traffic, variable traffic and variable vehicle approaches. We also learnt about computation of equivalent single wheel load from different consideration. We also discussed about equivalent standard axle load factors for converting the repetitions of a given axle load into equivalent repetitions of standard axle and also learnt about vehicle damage factor and how that can be used to convert a given volume of commercial traffic into equivalent cumulative standard axle load repetitions. We also discussed about axle load surveys or wheel load surveys that can be conducted and also about the importance of considering lateral placement characteristics of wheel loads of commercial vehicles and we have seen how using all this information equal number of standard axle loads can be estimated for a design life period. Let us uh, see some questions that we would like to be answered. We will provide the answers for this in the next class. Explain the concept of fixed traffic, fixed vehicle and variable vehicle, variable traffic approaches for payment design. 
Second one is 100 repetitions of 140 kilo Newton axle load is equivalent to how many standard axle load repetitions. Third is estimate the design traffic using the following data. There is a two lane road, average daily traffic is 4000 commercial vehicles per day, two way traffic, Ve vehicle damage factor is 5, design life is 15 years and rate of growth of commercial traffic is 7 percent. Answer for questions that we asked in the previous lesson is what are commercial vehicles? Why do we consider only these for payment design? Commercial vehicles are those which have a laden weight of more than 3 ton because smaller than these vehicles which carry smaller loads do not produce significant amount of stresses so as to cause significant damage to the payment that is why we would not consider other than commercial vehicles. What is the legally permissible gross weight for a vehicle having two axles? Front axle has got single wheels and rear axle has got dual wheels. As you have seen in the previous lesson, if a axle has got single wheels on either end, permissible limit is 6 tons and if a axle has got dual wheel set on either end, permissible limit is 10.2 ton. So, therefore, in this case 6 plus 10.2, 16.2 tons is the permissible limit. Next, show the different typical load con contact shapes that can be considered for a single wheel load of 20 kilo Newton and tire pressure of 0.6. I am sure this will be in a position to calculate. You have the load given, you have the contact pressure given. If it is assumed to be circular contact area, 20,000 divided by 0.6 that would give the area and you can calculate the load radius. Similarly, you can calculate other shapes that we have discussed in the earlier step. For a six lane divided highway carrying total two way volume of 8000 commercial vehicles per day with 50 50 directional speed, what is the design daily traffic? So, we have a divided carriageway, it is a 50 50 directional split. So, in one direction we will have 4000 commercial vehicles per day. Since we have three lanes in each direction, if you refer to the previous lesson, we have said 60 percent of the traffic in this direction has to be taken if it is a three lane separate carriageway that you have. So, this becomes 4000 into 0 0.6 that is equal to 2400 commercial vehicles per day that is the traffic that we have to consider in this direction. Of course, that we have to adjust this for uh, using appropriate vehicle damage factor and then convert this into equivalent standard axle load repetitions that in fact is the input that we are going to use for payment design. That comes with this we come to the close of this lesson. So, thank you.